Well, good morning and welcome to church. Welcome to Montrose South and Ferriden online service. Uh, a little bit different introduction this morning. I come here to the southern end of Montrose Beach. That bit I know is Glaxo Beach, though I don't think that name officially occurs. But welcome, wherever you're joining us from, uh, whenever you're joining us, it's great to see you with us. I'm here for a reason, and I'll come to that in a minute, but for now, let's cut to church family celebrations. So to celebrations, we hope those who had birthdays during the week, Jenny and Alan had a great time, and we wish Di Miller a happy birthday for her, birth, her birthday on Thursday of this week. Happy birthday, Di. Have a great day. Blessings to you all. And another celebration, this time a celebration of prayer. The, the railings outside the, our premises in Castle Street, Montrose and Church Road, Ferriden have become festooned with ribbons, each ribbon representing a prayer or perhaps even more than one prayer. As the final photograph will show, there's a, a poster with suggestions for prayer, though you, people are welcome to either use that or say their own prayer or just ask a blessing on a member of a family or a friend or, or whatever is on their heart. So that's Church Road, Ferriden and uh, outside Ferriden Church and also Castle Street, Montrose, outside our Philos Community Hub. Can't be missed. You'll see the ribbons. You'll see the poster. If you want to pop along and add your own prayers, you're more than welcome. So we're here at the beach and I've come here for a reason, it's uh, Mike later on will talk a little bit about uh, creation and a little bit about pilotage and he ties the two together. So I thought we'd come to the outside to this bit of the beach here this morning. And I'm reminded as I think of this morning service of uh, what the psalmist writes. He says, Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. And he goes on in verse 3 to write, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? He talks about the vastness of creation, the heavens, the moon and the stars. We're here at the sea uh, and even the, these huge boats that go out are like rowing boats on the vastness of the ocean. We as human beings are like uh, ants on the surface of the, of the earth. And what is God, what are we, what is mankind that God is mindful of us? You see, every life matters to God. Every life is precious to God. You are precious to God. That is what he's saying here. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? God is mindful of you. So let's worship God as we come with that hymn of invitation. Come people of the risen King. Come and worship God. Come and rejoice.
Let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come together as your people in praise and worship. We are in our own homes and are glad to recognise that your church is your people, the living stones and not the buildings. Thank you that because of coronavirus, your word is spreading to more and more homes throughout the world. Your power is not limited, you are not diminished by challenging circumstances and we worship your awesome majesty. We praise you and acknowledge your authority over us and the world where you have placed us. You have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. You have made yourself known to us by your mercy and grace. We are overwhelmed by your love and provision for us. In your presence we become more aware of our unworthiness. We sin accidentally and deliberately, not just occasionally but repeatedly. Forgive us most of all for allowing other people and things to take your place in our lives. We join King David in asking you to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. We can only survive and thrive as we depend on your love, grace and salvation. Thank you that your forgiveness is freely given because Jesus has reconciled us to you by his death and resurrection. We are so glad to be your children who can worship you in freedom and peace. We ask for your blessing on our time together, that we will hear you speaking to our receptive hearts, that our praise will give you great joy in and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Hear us now as we join our voices to pray in the words that Jesus gave his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from temptation. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and for ever. Amen. Our reading this morning is the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Genesis 1, verse 1, the beginning. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land and gathered the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants, and trees in the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. <coughs> and God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from night, 
and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creature of the sea and every living and moving thing which the water teems according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas that the birds increase on the earth and there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and all creatures that move along the ground, according to their kinds, and God said, saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over all the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground. Everything that has the breath of life in it, I give it every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that all he had made and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Amen. And may God to bless to us this reading from his word. Good morning on Sunday the 14th of June. I'm not too sure what the weather's going to be like this morning. But I first started thinking about this talk in late May or early June, when the sun was splitting the stones, as we say in Northern Ireland. This influenced my thoughts, but we'll come back to that later. This is the second time that I've given one of these talks. I'm not proposing to make a habit of it, but I'll continue to do so on an occasional basis if it helps Jeff to focus on other support needs. And I have to say in my notes, occasional basis was underlined and in bold. However, when preparing and delivering these talks, I've come to realise that one will effectively be speaking on behalf of God. And as you can appreciate, this is both a tremendous privilege and an awesome responsibility. In preparing each talk, the prospective speaker must seek and pray for inspiration and landing on a suitable topic, though in some cases external guidance may be available. In delivering the talk, he or she must be open to the Holy Spirit, allowing God's message to be passed on. 
effectively speaking for God. This is difficult enough for the likes of me, an occasional speaker, with lots of time to meditate on what that message might be. How much more difficult is it for the regular minister who has to do this week in, week out? He or she deserves any or all of the assistance we can give in delivering this most important task. More than anything else, he or she needs our prayers. And now I have a short uh, note to myself, which I am happy to share with all who are listening. Don't be overly critical of the speaker, which is very easy to do when you're sitting in the pews. I certainly am personally guilty of this from time to time. I have to recognise that it's not easy to prepare and present these talks week by week. So I must be patient and understanding and pray for discerning God's assistance in the talk. You mustn't give up doing this. It'll be in there somewhere. And now we come to the main part of my talk. We thank God that reports indicate that the frequency of new infections of the coronavirus would now appear to be decreasing. However, it is still out there and we must not let our guard down. The consequences of this virus and the associated lockdown imposed by the government have been many and varied. In human terms, many loved ones have been taken from their families before their time, dying a lonely death, fighting for breath. Families have not been able to visit or say goodbye. Livelihoods have been threatened or lost. We've not been able to meet friends or family. There have been impact on relationships. And there has been an impact on mental health, which may well be a long-term issue. On the economic front, many businesses are on hold. Their futures are uncertain. There's likely to be a significant increase in the national debt which means that many publicly funded activities will be cancelled or suspended. There's probably an implication for future taxation and future government planning. There will almost certainly be a long tail of effects. Some of these have been referred to above, but there's likely to be many others. So how did this situation arise? Apart from the fact that it appeared to emerge from Wuhan in China, sometime towards the end of 2019. Little of the origin of the virus is known. There may be an inquiry to determine this, but how thorough this would be may be questionable. There may have been potential human involvement, but again, this is uncertain. However, the spread of the virus certainly facilitated by global mobility. In the run-up to the outbreak, whilst people were still infectious, and for some time afterwards, thousands, millions of people were crisscrossing the globe each day without restrictions or checks. The virus jumped on these free rides to spread far and wide. And it's not as if we did not have lessons about what might happen. In the UK, we had previously experienced the effects of free unrestricted movement of virus carriers during the foot and mouth epidemic of 2000. Then it was vulnerable beasts, but this time it is ourselves that is affected. Then there were simulation exercises, both UK-wide and in Scotland, in the years 2015 to 2018. And the general conclusion was that it was when, not if, something like this would happen. Sadly, the shortfalls in preparedness were identified, including the lack of suitable PPE, but little or no action seems to have been taken. So what is the point I'm trying to make here? It is this. There seems to have been human involvement at almost all stages in the evolution of the situation in which we now find ourselves. And in the middle of all this, the natural cycle continues as usual. Over the last 10 weeks, we've seen the trees coming into full leaf. 
In the gardens and the fields, the spring flowers are blooming in their full glory, and one cannot help but thinking of the verses in Matthew, and I quote from the King James Bible. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The words of Christ himself. In the bush outside our kitchen window, there are blackbirds and sparrows going about their business of rearing chicks. We haven't seen any yet, but the song of the male blackbird as he defends his territory is a joy to listen to. In the present situation, the contrast between the ordered beauty of the natural world and the chaos resulting from the present COVID-19 crisis would have been remarkable at any time. It's particularly poignant this year in some of the best spring weather that most of us will remember. As I have said, I began preparing this talk in late May when the weather was amazing. It's a bit ironic that a factor which may have contributed to this exceptional weather was the reduction in traffic from March onwards as the lockdown took effect. Nature was also amazing some examples which immediately come to mind were the fact that the countryside was awash with the yellow whin and white hawthorn blossoms. With the stilling of traffic, nature voices could be heard. Indeed, the dawn and evening choruses were joys to listen to. There were reports of animals and plants reoccupying places from which they had been absent for many years due to human interference. Luckily, here in Tayside, the farmers are saying that As long as pickers can be found, this year's harvest of soft fruits will be among the best ever. So I have to ask myself, is there a message from God in this for us? And yes, I think there is. I think God is saying to us, look at the world I have made as a home for you. It's beautiful, wonderful and marvellous. It's as good as when I first made it. And it can still sustain all your needs. However, like any dwelling place, I would suggest that there must be some house rules for our home planet. For starters, these might include, we should care for it, maintain and cherish it. We should treat all human occupants as equals, and we should respect all other creatures living on it. We should not abuse it, take more from it than it could sustainably give, pillage its resources for short-term greed or gain, exploit its most vulnerable inhabitants for any reason, or interfere with the controls and balances that God has put in place to maintain its stability. So how do we do this? Well, God in his wisdom has given us a guide, which brings me on to my next point. This sees me coming back to my original theme, discussing topics prompted by my earlier career, and in particular nautical matters. In this instance, I'd like to look at the subject of pilots. Most people understand this to refer to the person advising the master when entering or leaving port, or transiting other hazardous waters, and this may be the subject for a future talk. However, on many ships, the word has two principal meanings. In the UK, the Admiral has prepared sailing directions providing navigational information for most parts of the world. These are published as a series of distinctive books, and volumes appropriate to the trading areas are carried on many UK ships and also many foreign flag vessels. They are comprehensive and extensive. For example, the west coast of Scotland has one volume for itself. To those in the trade, these books are almost universally referred to as the pilots. Owing to the amount of information they contain, they require frequent updating and correction. And as navigating officer in the deep sea, it's my responsibility to ensure that the publications were updated as corrections were received. 
This occupied many night watches when crossing the less frequented parts of the Atlantic or the Pacific, where no other traffic was likely to be encountered. I am reminded of these times when taking the night watch on the prayer vigil. So do we have a pilot for our voyage of faith through life? And yes, I think we do. Without doubt, it is the Bible, God's manual or guide containing instructions for every aspect of this particular voyage. Better still, it is contained completely in one volume, and being a finished work, does not require any further corrections. Any discussion of the Bible is particularly topical just now, in view of its importance being emphasised, probably unintentionally, I have to say, by Donald Trump's recent antics in pursuit of a photo opportunity. I'm not even sure why he thought it important to hold a Bible on that particular occasion. However, his actions prompted many comments from those with much better ways with words than myself. I particularly like the comment from Carl Barth, which Jeff posted on the MSNF chat site on Thursday a week ago, differentiating between holding or being held by the Bible, summarising his comments. To hold the Bible is to make it about us and our agenda, but being held by the Bible is to recognise that it's God's agenda, not ours, which has to take precedence. So what will our future voyage look like? Many have attempted to predict this, but there are still a lot of uncertainties. I think, however, it is fairly certain that the new normal is likely to be very different to the old. This is perhaps best summed up by the first line of L.P. Hartley's novel, The Go-Between. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. However, if we are held by the Bible and use it as our guide, the future will not present any impossible challenges and we should not fear it. What a message is that to end with? Well, Many thanks for joining this service. I hope you've been able to discern God's message for you in my talk. And I pray that the week ahead will be peaceful for all of us. God bless. Amen. So it was windy on the beach with the waves crashing against the shore. And while we were there, the sea gold crest was making her way out of the harbour. One of the oil supply ships that had been in the safe haven of Montrose Harbour, making her way out through along the estuary, past Gerdiness, out onto the open sea to brave the wind and the waves of the North Sea. And along with Mike's reflection, I couldn't help but make me think of a song by Ian White, which has in the second verse the lines, A ship that's in the harbour is stay, still and safe from harm, but it was not built to be there, it was made for wind and storm. The song's about stepping out into unknown territory with God at our side. Though I feel afraid of territory unknown, I know that I can say that I do not stand alone. For Jesus, you have promised your presence in my heart. I cannot see the ending, but it's here that I must start. And all I know that you have called me, and that I will follow, is all I can say. And we know that when we go where Christ calls us, when we walk in that unknown territory, that Jesus, our pilot, walks with us, walks in us, is in us by his Holy Spirit. Let's just take a moment to reflect as we listen to the tune of Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Gordon Penryn plays on his violin.
Heavenly Father, the psalmist says that you are the God who answers prayer. All of humanity comes before you with their requests. And your word also tells us to be anxious about nothing, but in everything with prayer and petition to make our requests known to you. In this country, Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. Thank you, Lord, for friends and family. Thank you that we're now able to begin seeing each other again. And we pray especially for those we know and love who do not yet know you. We pray that they will come to know you. Thank you that the infection rate of the coronavirus is falling. And thank you for all our key workers, those who are working to care for the sick and elderly, those who supply our food and keep our essential services going. Thank you, Lord, that we have freedom to worship you. We think of the worldwide church family, those who live in countries where Christians are persecuted and where, in spite of the coronavirus challenges, attacks on Christians have not stopped and where Christians are ignored when official aid is being distributed. And we pray for the vulnerable and the displaced in so many countries. This morning we think of India, where Christians are often forced to choose between their family and their faith in you, and where there are anti-conversion laws in several states making it difficult for Christians to share their faith. Lord, your word tells us to pray for those in authority. So we pray now for our politicians that they will make decisions with wisdom and integrity, truth and compassion. And that the UK government will be a strong force for good in foreign policy and bringing relief throughout the world. Closer to home, we remember those who are ill and those who have been bereaved. We pray for all those for whom lockdown has been a struggle and whose mental health is affected, for those who have lost their livelihoods and are worried about the future. We pray for those where homes have not been safe havens and we especially remember our vulnerable children. Lord, you have adopted us into your family and today I want to pray for children within our care system. Pray for wisdom and compassion for social workers and others who have such important decisions to make about the lives of children. And I pray for foster parents and all those who have adopted children that you will especially bless them, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers and we ask them all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. 
together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us today and forever. Mm -hmm.